Down rules and check in on those dwelling at level two. A high profile Māori leader says she won't stand by while a monstrosity of an Erebus memorial is built at an Auckland park. A new report reveals the extent of the boys' club in the police force, and the government unveils the rules of engagement for its Pharmac review. And Bitcoin, it's a bit more of a carbon footprint than you think. RNZ News at 5. Kia ora ko Susana Lea Tawa tēnei. The police commissioner is rejecting accusations in a scathing report that the way it promotes officers could be corruption. The Independent Police Conduct Authority report painted a toxic culture in the police force. Present and former staff say it is a boys' club that is rife with bullying. The authority's chair, Judge Colin Doherty, says managers appoint people who are their friends, are not up to the job and who in some cases are being investigated for misconduct. He says that amounts to corruption. Well, it depends how you define corruption, but I would have thought that anything that circumvented a proper and established process could come within a wide definition of corruption. The police commissioner, Andrew Costa, doesn't agree, saying no appointments are made for personal financial gain. Health officials will review their response to the latest outbreak to look for potential improvements, but insist their messaging has been very clear. The Ministry of Health attempted to contact one family at least 15 times, but never visited the household in person. A student in that family later tested positive for COVID-19 and had not been self-isolating. The Director-General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says he's certain all school families were given clear instructions. I'm confident we were, we were doing a good job, but of course we always go back and review and see was there anything we could have done better and how could we improve it. The head girl of Papatoetoe High School says students tend to get up-to-date information from their peers and the school, not government channels. Rhonda Nguyen says the school worked hard to provide up-to-date information and she's aware of the official public health messaging. They are on Instagram, I believe. I've seen posts around work, like updates as well. I just, I guess for us, we rely on our smaller community. So like for me, it would be like my school. And that's where I've been getting a lot of my information from. Rhonda Nguyen. The government is being warned people will die unless it reconsiders what the inquiry into drug buying agency Pharmac examines. A panel of experts has been appointed to review the agency, assess its performance and consider whether it needs new objectives. The review, however, will not look at any decisions Pharmac has made in the past or is currently considering and if they were appropriate. It also won't scrutinise government funding. Patient voice Aotearoa spokesperson Malcolm Mulholland says the agency's budget is the root cause of many of its problems. The Tourism Minister says he won't make any promises to struggling communities in Franz Josef and Fox Glacier. He was on the West Coast today to speak with businesses and residents about their concerns and field questions. It follows a plea for more support and a nearly $35 million wish list to keep the communities afloat. But Stuart Nash has ruled out funding the entire request, especially the wage subsidy extension. Look, we've been very honest. We cannot save every single business. And the government hasn't got a black checkbook we can write to every business that is struggling. And that is a really hard message to give, but it's one that does need to be given. As mentioned, we are working on a workshop at the moment that will look to provide support uh, until the borders do open, but that has to go to Cabinet before we can release anything there. Stuart Nash. New South Wales Police say their investigation into an historical rape allegation against a federal cabinet minister is now closed. Police say there is insufficient admissible evidence to proceed with an investigation. An anonymous letter sent to several members of parliament alleged a woman was raped in 1988 by a man who is now a minister. Police say the woman contacted them in 2019 but did not detail her allegation in a formal statement before taking her own life last year. Prime Minister Scott Morrison says the minister absolutely rejects the allegation. It's four minutes past five.
The All Blacks halfback Aaron Smith says the team's semi-final exit at the 2019 World Cup factored into his decision to re-sign with New Zealand rugby for another two years. The 32-year-old has extended his contract until the end of the 2023 World Cup in France. Smith says he's keen to right the wrongs of two years ago when the All Blacks lost to England in the semi-finals of the tournament in Japan. Walking off in um, Tokyo was a terrible feeling. Four years of hard work, gone. All the weight, you could just feel it. And not saying that I walked off there saying that I made me for that next World Cup, but how I felt at that moment, I was like, that is something I'd love to push forward to and try and put that right. Aaron Smith, the Silver Ferns, will reignite their netball rivalry with Australia tonight as they kick off the Constellation Cup Series in Christchurch. The two sides haven't played each other since 2019 due to the COVID-19 travel restrictions. New Zealand mid-quarter Sam Winders says they always look forward to the Trans-Tasman battle. The Aussies bring something else to the game besides just their physical presence they have you know, that Aussie bravado. So it's very much like no other team when you play against them, but it's probably our favourite battle. Meanwhile, former Silver Ferns player and coach Wai Marama Tomonu and her predecessor as New Zealand coach Ruth Ankin has been awarded, have been awarded, Nebel New Zealand's highest honour, being named Life Members of the National Body. That's the news. The Myanmar protests take a violent turn. And now the police are coming and everyone is running. Promises of punishment for lockdown rule breakers. You're committing an offence that could be prosecuted and see you put in jail for up to six months. And a call to arms over the economy. What we're trying to do is get into a better place in a year, so we're not just in the foxhole fighting. Still having the battle, we've actually won the war. In the trenches, morning report, weekdays from six, on air and online. Now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight tomorrow. Northland to Waitomo, including Coromandel, Peninsula, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taumaranui. Scattered showers, some heavy this afternoon and evening, and again tomorrow morning with thunderstorms possible with hail. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mainly fine. A shower or two tomorrow afternoon and evening. Taranaki and Thai, to Wellington, also wider upper. Fine spells and isolated showers. Showers becoming widespread and possibly heavy inland during the afternoon and and evenings. For Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, outbreaks of rain or showers with thunderstorms possible along the west coast tomorrow. Canterbury mainly fine, a shower or two possible tonight. Otago and Southland, a few showers, possibly heavy and thundery this afternoon for Dunedin and Clutha. And Chatham Islands, mostly cloudy with drizzle possible tomorrow. RNZ National, seven minutes past five. Thanks, Susana. Kia ora. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. Tonight, a damning report into police details a toxic culture of a boys' club rife with bullying. But first, the government is being told to hurry up with its public vaccination awareness campaign to avoid being drowned out by the anti-vax movement. The Ministry of Health says it's got plans for a paid advertising campaign and it will launch in the coming months. But with vaccines already being offered to border workers and their families, community leaders worry that anti-COVID protesters are the loudest voices out there right now and they could be putting people off. Nita Blake-Person reports. Northland border workers were the latest cab off the rank in getting their COVID vaccines yesterday. Brooke Sneddon welcomed her shot and the hope it gives. Maybe travelling soon, maybe it could help stop the spread of COVID-19, which means that we can all get back to a normal life everywhere, hopefully. But elsewhere in Whangarei, Mia Cheryl Mai says the message around vaccines isn't so positive. What we're seeing on the ground here uh, are the protesters and um, they're making themselves very visible. They're putting their placards up, they're um, putting flyers into leader boxes, leaving them in public toilets. Um, so, you know, that, unfortunately, from my perspective, that's what we're seeing. While countries like Australia are already pushing their COVID vaccine campaigns, Cheryl Mai says that visibility is missing in the North. It doesn't feel to be as um, as strong a, a campaign about the, the benefits of vaccines. Uh, and as, um, as is rightly pointed, out. Unfortunately, our vaccine, vaccination rate is low for we've had um, the measles, uh, the uptake wasn't great. You know, it's such an important part of our, our health that uh, a campaign should really be in full swing now. 
And she's not the only one worried. The University of Auckland's Dr Andrew Chen researches digital technology and ethics and says while there's been a push from community groups to inform people about the vaccine, official information from the Ministry of Health isn't being seen. The longer that we wait for an official messaging campaign, the longer that there's um, misinformation and disinformation to travel. Um, and we know that misinformation and disinformation can spread very, very quickly. Um, and so people need to be prepared for that to happen. Um, one of the most important things that we could do is pre-bunking, which is making sure that people are aware of how the misinformation and disinformation is going to be um, spread. And so that when that happens, they are prepared for it and know how to process it in, in their heads. Um, I think that we are close to missing an opportunity to do that here in New Zealand. The ministry does have plans for an awareness campaign around the vaccine. Back in January, it said it was recruiting the creative agencies that would be involved and would work with community leaders, social influencers and media to promote the official information. The plan then was for the first stage to roll out in mid-February. Today, Dr Ashley Bloomfield didn't seem to know why that had yet to happen. Uh, there hasn't been a hold-up, but uh, the, uh, it's just ready, it's all ready to go and we're just waiting to get that underway. But as you're aware, the, the first phase is with our, our border and MIQ workforce and their families, and that's, that's going well. So but the awareness campaign wasn't meant to start in February? Uh, I'd have to come back to you on that, actually. I just haven't got the date in my mind exactly of when it was no used. There's no specific delay or reason for a delay. Dr Helen Petousis harris is on the government's COVID-19 Immunisation Implementation Advisory Group. She says she's aware there is a plan for a COVID awareness campaign, but the Ministry of Health is behind the eight ball in getting it out there. Meanwhile, misinformation campaigns are gaining more momentum. I think it's accelerating. Um, and it's quite well organised and it, um, it, it does seem to be, you know, taking over social media. While there's not a lot of people that are involved in this, they're very, very noisy. Some surveys show about a quarter of New Zealanders have some hesitations around receiving the vaccine. If they refuse, the government could be cutting it fine to reach its goal of having 70% of New Zealanders immunised. Dr Petusis Harris says there's no time to waste. You need to hurry up with all those amazing plans that, that you've got because I think this is, um, this is becoming really challenging for people on the front line. In a statement, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet said a paid advertising campaign targeting the general public had not yet commenced. Work was still in development and it would launch in the coming months. It said $14 million would be invested in the campaign, but it was always the intention to stagger it, targeting those who needed it first. It said communications and engagement to support the vaccine being rolled out to border and MIQ workforce and the people they live with had been underway for a number of weeks. For Checkpoint, Coordinator Blake Person Aho. It's 12 minutes past five, and if you were listening to that, you can watch the video. We'll put it up on our Facebook page. And, of course, you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. And still to come on the programme, Auckland's in lockdown, but what about the rest of the country? The pain of Level 2 is being felt by cities and towns around the traps. Auckland's latest lockdown has been accompanied by serious concerns people are simply ignoring the Level 3 rules, as well as those about isolating after getting a test. The health officials say instructions are clear, so we sent reporter Nick Truebridge and cameraman Nick Monroe to Papa Toy Toy to test if they are. Papa Toy Toy's main street, usually it'd be a buzz with grocers assembling crates of fruit and veg and sari shops setting up colourful window displays. It was the opposite today, surely a sign people are for the most part getting the message to stay home. Except the politicians and bureaucrats say despite clear guidelines, lockdown rules and testing rules have been broken here. So Checkpoint wanted to hear from the people who actually live in this vibrant South Auckland community. I'm standing outside Hunter's Plaza in Papatoi Toy. Now this mall is closely linked to some of Auckland's newest cases. That's because one of those cases visited the gym here while he was waiting for a test result. I asked the people here whether they watched the Prime Minister's 1pm press conference, whether they know what terms like casual plus contact and close plus contact are, and whether when vaccinations arrive they'll be taking the jab. We started by asking the people here whether they actually watch the government's 1pm press conference, which is, after all, its main way of getting messaging to the wider public. 
most days? Yes, I do. Uh, not really. Most of the time I go out. Yes, I actually didn't yesterday. I'd forgotten about it yesterday. Busy doing, um, you know, housework and whatnot. But normally I do, and I will be today, yeah. Watching the briefings is one thing, but is this community actually getting the message to stay home? On Sunday, a group got together in Mangere East for a church service. That was after Auckland was put into lockdown. Police have now issued a written warning to a man over that gathering for not following lockdown rules. So, is the message getting through? There's certainly a change that I've noticed today. Uh, you know, looking at the traffic volumes along here on Great South Road the past few days, Really, you wouldn't have thought that there was any sort of levels uh, restriction going down. Today, I noticed that the, um, the volume certainly down in the last couple of days. Uh, you know, really the whole thing is, is that there's always going to be a certain percentage of people with a sociopaths or what have you. I'm going to give a tuppenies about the team. Everywhere I go, and especially on the train and the bus, people are wearing masks. Only one young idiot won't wear a mask, you know, ruined for everybody else. What about the instructions? Are they clear enough? Take technical terms like casual plus and close plus contact. Do people actually know what these mean? Yeah, I do, but I think it's unnecessarily complicated, really. Then the key message is uh, people just need to understand, you know, about exponential growth and how things can go pear-shaped overnight. And I don't think that message is really coming through enough. Um, it's just largely been too touchy-feely, frankly, and um, people aren't, you know, weren't taking it seriously. I think they could make it a bit, a, a bit easier to, re to remind people. Um, there are lots of terms and sayings, yeah, I agree with that. With the news and that, they have the, um, the deaf people, you know, maybe they should have some other culture there as well to to help to so that the other cultures understand we had more questions for the people here so we took a drive around the corner to the old papa toy toy shopping center on st george street here we asked people about the covid 19 vaccine when it rolls out what will the community do overwhelmingly the response is they will take the jab if you don't get that vaccination you'll never be safe Yes, definitely, most definitely, we, we will be planning to, to have that done. So I'll definitely get it because I, I see, um, I, I, I listen to a lot of media from the States and, and what they've happened over there, it's, it's terrible, man. Over half a million people died. If we had um, a government like they've had in the last year, we would be, we'd have like 12, 13,000 dead, plus um, it would be rampant in our community. So we're actually really lucky. Yeah, it's a hassle, yeah, the economy gets hurt, but in the end, people's more important, that's what I think. But it's clear there are some in this community who aren't sure about the vaccine. Um, I don't know, I'm a bit iffy about it, but if it means the safety of me and my family, yes. We wanted to know where this fear comes from. Rolled out so quickly and it's just the fact that it's a vaccine and I don't know what the what the side effects or things are going to be with it, so that's what scares me. We're not really looked after too well, and so you think um, potentially there's that, the worst scenarios of, of um, we'll try it out on the poorer communities, and really, um, so it's, it's, I think that's, for me, that's what, what's, um, yeah, but I, I you know, the, the, especially the Pfizer one, I'm pretty happy with that, or any of the ones that have been, been I, I would do it, just for, for the sake of, our, you know, our community, my family, I've got a, 79 year old mum who's got terminal cancer and diabetes living with us plus i've got two young grandchildren so um uh, as well um so i mean I'll, I'll take it just so to keep them safe others we spoke to say conspiracy theories are creeping into the minds of people in the south yeah i've sort of seen on social media some people that i would have thought were halfway intelligent sort of like throwing around anti-vax bs and i'd like to virtually slap them Meanwhile, one thing the community can't afford to buy into is complacency, with Director General of Health Ashley Bloomfield having this to say today. Now, the fact there is no new community case today is reassuring, but clearly we are uh, early on in this journey and not yet out of the woods. Based on last week's exposure events, which are listed on the Locations of Interest page on the Ministry's website, we would expect to start see any potential positive cases coming through from today onwards. But it seems Dr Bloomfield and his colleagues may need to do more 
to make sure this community's on the same page. For Checkpoint, Nick Truebridge. And if you were listening to that piece from Nick, we'll put it up on our Facebook page uh, and you can watch the video. Now, we're keen for your feedback on that story. Let us know, do you think the messages are clear from the Ministry of Health? Are they targeting the right people? And also, are they getting to younger individuals? Text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. An independent report has detailed a toxic culture and a boys' club operating within the police force. Some are bullied so badly their hair has fallen out and others have suffered from PTSD. The review was launched after an RNZ investigation where almost 200 current or former police staff came forward to lift the lid on bullying rife in the force. The IPCA report shows 40% of police staff have suffered some form of bullying or harassment in the past year. One in ten say it's ongoing, sustained and targeted. Charlotte Cook filed this story. Promotions given to friends of management, racism and sexism, a culture of fear or punishment, and those who complained often re-victimised. These are just some of the findings of a year-long report painting a bleak picture of behaviours in the police force. The IPCA's chair, Judge Colin Doherty, says the negative culture doesn't permeate every workplace but is localised to pockets of individuals or districts and points for a need for change. Those who expressed dissent or resisted the boys' club were often marginalised and ostracised. This could take the form of overt bullying behaviour designed to belittle, intimidate or humiliate. But more commonly, it manifested itself in subversive and insidious behaviour that was designed to marginalise. This could include petty physical obstruction. He says there was almost no confidence in the complaint system and it was very hard convincing people to talk, even with the promise of anonymity. But the experiences they heard were distressing. We had people who were senior police officers who were rendered speechless, who were so emotive and overcome with what they were telling us, many for the first time, I might say. We heard of the consequences of this type of behaviour. PTSD, anxiety, hair falling out. The report found the majority of people felt promotions weren't being made on merit, but rather who was mates with the right people. This led to further breeding of poor culture and management, and as a result, bullying and disrespectful behaviour became normalised, condoned and sometimes rewarded. Judge Colin Doherty says this could be considered corruption. Well, it depends how you define corruption, but I would have thought that anything that circumvented a proper and established process could come within a wide definition of corruption. But the Police Commissioner, Andrew Costa, disagrees. I've never seen uh, anything around an appointment process that amounts to somebody uh, undertaking that action for personal benefit. Uh, what I've observed over time is a tendency for people to appoint people they've worked with in the past. I would be hesitant to describe it as corruption, but either way it's unacceptable and we need to make sure it doesn't happen. He thanked the victims of bullying who came forward and says what they experienced is unacceptable. And even though the report said poor behaviour was often hidden, he's confident it will be stamped out. It is a terrible situation to be bullied in any context and that's not what we aspire to for our workplace. So I feel for those who came forward, I, I thank them for coming forward and welcome what the report is telling us about where we need to be as an organisation. A former HR employee from police headquarters says the report is accurate and balanced and vindicates many of the experiences of people within the workforce, but he is worried it's just a repeat of earlier reports. The 2004 Commission of Inquiry covered a lot of the same material and made a lot of the same recommendations and had a 10-year implementation period. You'd have to wonder when you write another report like that, if the Commission of Inquiry in 10 years didn't do it, what's the chances that this report is going to make a difference? Another former employee who was bullied almost daily says none of it comes as a surprise, but he's not confident the bullies will be removed or that things will change. A viewpoint Commissioner Costa will be trying to dispel. For Checkpoint, Charlotte Cook.
A high-profile Māori leader is thinking about occupying an Auckland park to stop construction of a controversial Erebus memorial. 257 people died when an Air New Zealand plane crashed into Mount Erebus in November 1979. And after much heated debate, the memorial build is due to start this week at Parnell's Dovemeyer Robinson Park. But Dame Nida Glavish from Ngāti Whātua believes the spot chosen near the old Matahari Hari Pa site and a sprawling Pahuta Kawa tree is not appropriate for what she describes as a steel and concrete monstrosity. And she says local iwi hasn't been properly consulted. I asked Dame Nida to explain exactly what's wrong with the proposed memorial. Number one, it's being planned oh, at Mataharehare, which is one of the last of the past sites in Tamaki Makoro. And number two, it has this amazing, over 180-plus-year-old pohutukawa that is right there where they intend to put the monument. And number three, what did it have to do with Erebus? Absolutely nothing other than a family member from the Erebus lives in Parnell. Other members come from all over the country. However, there are families that I know of who's made contact with me who did not agree that it go there. And why is it going there is the answer I would like. Why is it going there? You know, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have a memorial. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying it should not be at Mataharehare. Is it not possible for the three things to coexist together, the Pahutakawa, Mataharehare and a memorial? Well, they're saying, to me, they're saying to me that, you know, they'd only have to cut off a couple of the branches of the Pahutakawa and, and, and parts of the roots. And I'm saying it's a living tree. You stick a nail in your big toe and see if that's going to affect the rest of your body. It is a living tree. And it is a living tree that's been living there for over 180 plus years. And we want to disturb its roots in the whenua and that sacred whenua at that so that we can put up concrete and steel um, as a memorial to Erebus that happened 40 years ago. I'm saying there are other sites. They know there are other sites, but I want to know exactly who chose that site. In terms of consultation, obviously uh, the local board voted this through. There was an opportunity for people to yeah, make... Yeah, there was a 3-4. Yep. There and was there... a 3-4 vote, yep. And people made submissions. Did you get involved in that process at the time? No, I didn't, actually. I, I wasn't even aware it was going on. Um, but no, I didn't. And, and I'm sorry I didn't. I'm, I'm not quite sure how I missed out on that consultation process, but I wasn't involved. And Dame Nader, speaking today, are you speaking for yourself or are you speaking on behalf of Ngāti Whātua or what hat are you wearing? Oh, how about if I just wear my caring hat for Nader Glavish, who actually born and raised in Tamaki Makoto, lived on the Kaipara Harbour, between Waitamata and the Kaipara. I don't want to involve anybody else because those who do support what I'm saying will come in themselves and speak for themselves. I don't need an army to say what I need to say, which I know is right. So would you, would you consider it offensive if this went ahead? Yes, I would. Absolutely, I would. Of course I would. I mean, the first offence that happened there, Lisa was Mataharehare had its name changed to Sir Dovemeyer Robinson Park. Where was the consultation of that? And now it's being again desecrated with a memorial on it to Erebus of which it had nothing to do with. You've written to the Prime Minister and a number of senior ministers yes, I have. about I have. this. Who have you heard back from? I heard back from the Prime Minister. She rang me last night. What did she say to you? She said that, um, um, well, she apologised that I wasn't involved in the consultation process 
And um, she did say that uh, she would try to get people to contact me who um, who would be able <clears throat> um, to speak to me about the things that I'm concerned about. And there's only one concern, relocate that site. And this afternoon, I received a call from uh, the CEO of the ministry. And my immediate question to her was, are you ringing me so that we could um, reconsider, renegotiate, and start from the beginning with regards to the intent to put that memorial at Mataharehare? Her response to me was, well, actually, no, it's going to go ahead. I said, so what's the purpose of this call? So what's your next move then? Oh, well, I'm going to be thinking about it. I'm going to have a meeting about it. There will be. I will not lay down to this and, and, and think it will go away because it was a decision made by a group, a, a small group of people. There are families, at least, who have contacted me and said that they didn't agree. It go there. But you would know, Dame Nader, there are lots of families who are desperate to have a memorial. It's more than four decades, and they want something to remember their loved ones. And so a number of them made submissions in support of this memorial at this location. What do they do? Well, what do they do? They can still have that relocated. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have a memorial at all. Why does it have to be at Mataharehare Park, is what I'm asking. And and what was explained to me was that it had to be on a height and so that the thing could look like it was a flight pattern taking off. I stood by that Pohutukawa tree. I looked out from the base of it to the the Waitamata Harbour and looked out straight across to Rangitoto and that monument would block all that view. Totally block it. Is that really what the descendants of the urban crash want? Is is the need for tomorrow's tomorrow's residents of Tamaki Makoto uh, uh, that site to spoil the park and and devastate Mataharehare for what? As far as you understand it, when is construction due to start? Oh, yesterday. Right. So when yesterday, you say that's why, that's why I was talking uh, so loudly yesterday, and I am still talking loudly today. When you say you are not going to lay down and let this happen, what do you mean? What are your options? I will meet and I will talk about it, Lisa. I am not going to say, well, I'm going to do this, this, and something else. I am not going to lay down and just let it happen. No way. And we need to really examine how did it get this far? Where is the power base that actually took it to this far now? So given your very strong feelings, is it, a, is it an option for you to occupy that site to prevent construction? Well, yeah. I can tell you, no, anything's an option. Anything is an option. So you're considering that, are you? Yes, I am. And yes, I will. Do you know when you will reach a decision, Dame Nader? Lisa, cut it out, will you? I said to you that I will meet, and that's the only information that I'm going to give. And that was Dame Nader Glavish there. A spokesperson from the Ministry for Culture and Heritage has provided a statement. It says the Prime Minister had a positive conversation with Dame Nader last night. The Ministry for Culture and Heritage followed up with Dame Nader today. Further information was offered to address her concerns, including a meeting with the independent arborist and details of the extensive iwi engagement that has occurred over the past three years. Since the project was announced in November 2017, The families of the 257 people who died in the Erebus tragedy have been kept at the heart of this process.
Checkpoint on RNZ National. The government unveils the rules of engagement for its Pharmac review. Not everyone is happy. How is life at level two? Well, we take a virtual roadie. Instagram this and TikTok that. Are young people hearing and heeding the COVID message? We would love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. Do get in touch about the Erebus Memorial and some of the issues raised in that interview. Text us on 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or Facebook us at Checkpoint. Our email address is Checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Time for the headlines now with Susana. The police commissioner is rejecting accusations the way it promotes officers could be corruption. A report by the Independent Police Conduct Authority has painted a toxic culture in the police workforce. The authority's chair says managers appoint people who are their friends and not up to the job, which amounts to corruption. The commissioner, Andrew Costa, doesn't agree, saying no appointments are made for personal financial gain. Health officials will review their response to the latest COVID outbreak in Auckland, but insist their messaging has been very clear. The Ministry of Health attempted to contact one family at least 15 times, but never visited the household in person. A student in that family later tested positive for COVID-19 and had not been self-isolating. The Director-General of Health says he's certain all school families were given clear instructions. Meanwhile, there are fears a slow rollout of the COVID vaccine awareness campaign could mean people refuse the jab. The Health Ministry says the campaign is ready to go, but there is not a definite date for its start. However, a leading vaccinologist says in the meantime, misinformation campaigns are gaining momentum and health officials need to get moving quickly to reassure people. The government is being warned people will die unless it reconsiders what the inquiry into drug buying agency Pharmac examines. A panel of experts has been appointed to review the agency and its objectives. However, the review will not look at any decisions Pharmac has made or scrutinise its funding. But the group Patient Voice Aotearoa says the agency's budget is the root cause of many of its problems. Lady Gaga's dog walker is recovering from what he calls a very close call with death after being shot several times by kidnappers who took two of the pop star's three dogs. The pop star offered a half a million dollars reward for the return of the two stolen dogs, which have since been handed to police unharmed. Those are the latest news headlines on RNZ National. Our next news and weather is at six. Thanks, Susana. Kia ora anō. This is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. And it's time for the business news now with Giles Beckford. So we'll zoom down to our Wellington studio for that. Speaking of zooming, Giles Rocket Labs' Peter Beck tells entrepreneurs to shoot for the stars. I see what you did there. Oh, uh, I shouldn't try it again then, should I? Good evening to you, Lisa. Yes, it was just the conversation. I know all the attention's been on what a great success Rocket Lab is as a New Zealand company. And, uh, of course, Peter Beck is, is our new local tech hero. Uh, and, you know, it's a $5.5 billion float uh, on the NASDAQ exchange in the United States. But just at the end of the conversation that he had with us this morning, he was saying... That one of the differences between New Zealand entrepreneurs and American entrepreneurs is the way they think, the size of their thinking. And he was saying, uh, in New Zealand, you talk to an entrepreneur and they're saying, oh, I want to grow a, a business that's worth millions and millions and millions. He says, you talk to an entrepreneur in the United States and they talk about wanting to grow businesses that are billions and billions and billions. And, you know, obviously it was think big, For those who can remember, of course, think big back in the 80s, which didn't do us too well economically. Uh, But he was saying basically, shoot for the stars. It did make me think, though, that a lot of the smaller technology startups that we've had in the past four or five years in this country uh, have struggled to get anything beyond the initial seeding finances which have actually sent them to the Australian Stock Exchange to raise money because they get a better reception there. uh, And they say that the Australian investors understand technology uh, and those sorts of uh, businesses better than New Zealand investors do. So there's a bit of a disconnect there. I know there's quite a solid venture capitalism and angel finance sector in New Zealand. But... uh, Apparently, New Zealanders did pass up the opportunity to buy into Rocket Lab right at the very beginning. The super fund was one of the few local investors to get in there uh, a little bit later on. But it always was a U.S. company. That's where the money came from. uh, And that's where the profits will go, unfortunately.
Interesting. OK, so what news do you bring of the country's terms of trade? Well, normally I know your eyes would glaze over if I said fourth quarter terms of trade, but if I said this is... Uh, showing us how the economy is actually, or the export sector, is earning more. Uh, It means that we can buy more overseas for the same amount of export dollars. So that's the value of it. In other words, we're doing pretty well in a trade sense. And although trade only accounts for about uh, 30-odd percent of the economy, it's what's been the backbone of a lot of businesses uh, through the pandemic. Uh, So from that point of view, we should be thankful that terms of trade look good it, it, it came about because import prices were falling more quickly than export prices so uh, and we sold more actually more blocks of cheese and butter and uh, milk powder uh, than we did just the actual quantities were higher as well so it bodes well it will see us into 2021 with at least a reasonable footing given that we don't know what's going to happen with lockdowns and the like and how was the market looking today well, it had a real dose of uh, cheer early on. It caught the, uh, the, uh, the happy bug from Wall Street. It didn't last to the same extent. So we closed up just 43 points. It's about a third of a percent. That's 12,344. New Zealand dollar's been steady at 72.5 US cents, 93.3 Australian. Just note that the Reserve Bank of Australia held its uh, cash rate steady today. All the other monetary policy uh, left unchanged. It says it doesn't think it will get back to normal much before 2024. Something to bear in mind. Thanks, Giles. Giles Beckford joining us there from Wellington with our business news today. All talk and no support was the conclusion from Franz Joseph and Fox Glacier locals after a meeting with the Tourism Minister today. Stuart Nash and West Coast Tasman MP Damien O'Connor fronted struggling businesses and residents who have issued a plea for $35 million to save livelihoods. Tourism reporter Tess Branton was at the meeting in France Joseph and filed this report. Tourism Minister Stuart Nash says he wasn't in glacier country to make promises or announce any support. He says that means some businesses reliant on international visitors have to face some hard truths. Then it is time to have that very difficult discussion with your bankers your employers, your creditors and your community because we cannot save every business. And we, we looked at a wage subsidy for the five regions that were impacted the most by tourism and the cost of that was between 500 and a billion dollars. That was to the end of the year and that's just not sustainable. He says work is underway on reimagining tourism and a support package. Queenstown isn't going to get anything special over and above the other districts that are suffering to the point that I mentioned before. There's about five that are, that are over 50% reliant on international tourism for their, uh, for their local economy. West Coast Tasman MP Damien O'Connor acknowledges the $35 million wish list wouldn't touch the sides of the hole left behind by international visitors. My view is they need probably a lot more than that, you know, um, obviously that wouldn't go anywhere near replacing the turnover. They put a package and some ideas and we're working on some of those. Um, What the total quantum of that is, you know, that depends on a number of discussions Mm -hmm. at Cabinet. But there's some infrastructural projects here that should be able to run. The meeting didn't go quite as expected for Rob Jewell from Fox Glacier Guiding. Well, I actually arrived with high expectations that great that the tourism minister had taken the time to come travel all the way down to glacier country and that he would have something for us very tangible in terms of support. But unfortunately, he's come down here. He said the main purpose of his visit was to listen and there wasn't anything forthcoming. So in terms of he's left and we're empty handed and there's no additional support at this point, disappointed. About 97% of his business is usually focused on international visitors. We've been 12 months into this now and I would have thought the government would be really on top of it so that's why the high expectations that we would um, have something because we need it now. We've been hanging on for 12 months. How much longer do we need to hang on for? We need it now. Development West Coast Chief Executive Heath Milne says he was unfortunately prepared for no support to be announced, but it was still a sobering day. We had a message that there wasn't going to be a, a silver bullet delivered or a golden package delivered, and, and, and that certainly was the case because we, we didn't really get anything substantial. But he was still pleased the ministers took the time to visit. I'm sure you've got a feel for the 
the stresses and, and the pressure that this community or these communities here are under, and that was that was the key objective for today. And thanks for giving away five million of their own money back to them. That's pretty much what we're talking about. He says Stuart Nash is looking at whether that can be underwritten by a government scheme, but Heath Milne remains hopeful that some of the region's wish list could still get a green light. We haven't given up. The minister left the door slightly ajar in that there was nine items on the package request and certainly they've shut the door on the extension to the wage subsidy. But the other items, they're still on the table, so hopefully we'll get something out of that. Galicia Country Tourism's co-chair Richard Benton says he was left with more questions than answers at today's meeting. Look, to be frank, I was a little bit disappointed. We've done a very succinct and thorough survey that's gone out to business and that information has been well put together it has been presented to the minister so we were kind of hoping for a little bit more today given all the work and effort that had gone into in encouraging the minister to come down and, and talk to us rather than just a, a q a session to be frank he acknowledges stuart nash did mention a support package in the works but says that's nearly the extent of their knowledge on it Richard Benton says it's a high trust model. It gives us a glimmer of hope, but does it give us confidence? Gosh, I'm, I'm not sure I'd be that bold. With no government support on the immediate horizon and no firm trans-Tasman bubble dates, Glacier Country communities are bracing for even more losses to come. In Franz Joseph for Checkpoint, Cortes Brunton, TNA. A lot of you already getting in touch about the interview we did with name, uh, Dame Nader Glavish uh, just before on the Erebus Memorial planned for Parnell. Uh, Rosie says Parnell is irrelevant to Erebus. The memorial should be at the Antarctic Centre in Christchurch. Lee says I would happily have the Erebus Memorial here in Christchurch. We have a natural and ongoing leak link to the Antarctic. We are also generous and caring people who know how to support those in need. Bring it here. We will shower those who need it with love, aroha and peace. And Jeanette says the Erebus Monument has only one rightful place in plain view of Air New Zealand's office or the airport. Dame Nader is absolutely correct, says Jeanette. Do keep your feedback coming. While Auckland is having to go through another week at Level 3, the rest of the country is still feeling the squeeze. The move to Level 2 has resulted in events being cancelled, cafes, restaurants and bars down on takings and more people choosing to work from home. Our reporter Harry Locke has been seeing how the latest change in alert levels has been going down. In its 27-year history, the Newtown Festival, Wellington's vibrant, eclectic street party, has been neither cancelled nor postponed. All that changed last Saturday, when the Prime Minister announced Auckland would be returning to Alert Level 3, the rest of the country to Alert Level 2. Scheduled for Sunday, the festival could technically still have gone ahead, if alert levels do go back down this coming Saturday night. But for festival director Martin Hanley, that uncertainty wasn't an option. Putting people at risk when there's all performers, stallholders, travelling from through Auckland, from Auckland, all coming to Wellington and then all going home elsewhere in New Zealand, we could be a super spreader. It's our cow papa to look after people. Since the decision to postpone was made, it's been hectic. The last 12 months of planning had to be undone in the matter of a few hours. Urgent phone calls with sponsors, the council, volunteers, performers and stall holders. Co-director Anna Campbell-Welch says all their time now is being spent rescheduling for their new date, April 11th. We're just really, really happy that it can go ahead on another date, but we've been really busy trying to contact absolutely everybody who's involved to make sure that nobody turns up on Sunday saying, oh, where is everyone? <laughs> They're not the only event who are having to quickly change tack. Over the hill from Wellington, the Martin Fair has also been delayed until April. In Taranaki, the multi-ethnic extravaganza scheduled for Saturday had no choice but to cancel. And in Hawke's Bay, the national track and field champs bringing together 600 athletes, over 100 officials and hundreds of spectators, has also been postponed. Chief Executive of Athletics NZ, Peter Feisinger, says it's been difficult to find a new date. Hawke's Bay is a busy place and we're not the only ones postponing events. So it is going to depend on the accommodation availability to a degree, flight availability, but we think that's OK. The longer we postpone it, the worse it is for the athletes because 
they're ready now. It's not just events which are changing as a result of Level 2. Lisa Lee's Point Cafe and Bar in the Catlins is about as far away from Level 3 Auckland as you can get. Before the latest lockdown, she was having one of her busiest summers ever, as hordes of New Zealanders decided to discover this magic corner of Southland for the very first time. But she hasn't got enough staff to comply with the Level 2 requirement for table service only, and has had to close three quarters of the restaurant. So in our restaurant, we have gone from 11 to 12 tables down to 8, so that's Loss of revenue, obviously, and um, we can't do table service outside purely because we don't have the staff to be able to do it. So we've got another probably 10 to 12 tables outside as well. Anarchy, who works in Wellington City Centre, says the level change has been noticeable at work. A comment that came up today with my colleague was that office is so quiet, where is everyone? So I think more people are working from home. Even the traffic this morning, I live in Batoni, and the traffic is quite horrendous. But this morning was slightly different, so I did wonder about that. But in Napier, people weren't noticing the change so much. Life as, as usual compared to Auckland. Lucky to live here. I don't see any, any issue with level two. I'm finding level two. No worries. There, there, of course, there's um, procedures and um, carefulness. Definitely feeling the squeeze are the coffee shops reliant on the lunchtime rush of office workers. Azara Keenan, who runs Gotham Cafe in central Wellington, says there aren't many office workers about. Yesterday was even below 50%, so it's pretty hard. We can't stay open until our set time, and we had to close earlier because it was just too dead. Under Level 2, bars and restaurants are limited to 100 customers, who must be seated in separate groups and be served by a single waiter. In New Plymouth, Ajinkia Jagdala, the co-owner of a number of restaurants, says people aren't even wanting to come out. Quite a few functions that we've booked in for later on the week, they've been postponed or either cancelled. Even though we can have 100 people in the place and the functions are 30 people, 20 people, a lot of people do want to stay away from hospitality businesses. The owner of New Plymouth's nice hotel and table restaurant, Terry Parks, says they're being hit in the same way as Auckland operators. It folds down. We had all our rooms the following day cancelled. There was the new director of the art gallery. Her pofery was yesterday morning. Well, of course, all the rooms were cancelled. There was nine rooms. We had a dinner after the pofery here. That was cancelled. There is relief on the way, in the form of the government's latest round of wage subsidy. Many will be hoping it won't be needed for much longer. For Checkpoint... Harry Locke. And while many and various events up and down the South Island have been cancelled due to being locked down in Alert Level 2, some of the region's mayors insist it's where they need to be. Lisa, you've got Gary Tong, the proud mayor of Southland. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Where are you exactly? Um, I'm on the main road between uh, Invercargill and Riverton at the moment. Keeping your distance, a safe distance at Level 2 from anyone else you come across? Absolutely, and everyone's behaving themselves that I've seen today, which is great. How do you feel about being in Level 2? Is that where you should be at? Yeah, with the current situation um, further north, yes, it is the situation we need to be at, absolutely. Some people in Auckland prior to the lockdown at 6am headed off to other places, so we don't know who's out there. People further south, like Hamilton Way and stuff like that, are certainly worried, um, are the Coromandel, and, and, and that's the, the what they need to watch out there. What I'm concerned about is those that may have travelled further south, and no disrespect to anyone, they probably want to come and have a good look round, but we all want to be healthy. We've all got to be careful here. G'day Lisa, I'm Jamie Klein, the Mayor of Fuller District. And how are you faring in Level 2? Kind of business as usual, I think, in Level 2. Um, certainly in terms of our towns and, and people getting out and about, I think it uh, feels pretty pretty normal out on the street. Do you think it's the right level for you to be at? Is it necessary? Well, I mean, like, day to day you would argue it doesn't feel like it's necessary. Um, but, you know, I mean, we all know someone that's just got off the plane from Auckland, uh, you know, and, and getting around. So you're only ever sort of one plane right away from uh, from the situation Auckland are finding themselves in. So I guess in that sense, you know, I'm comfortable with it. Um, level 2 we can operate reasonably well at. Kira, I'm Brian Cadogan, Mayor of the Kluka District. I was a sharer before I was a mayor, so what would I know about it? And I've just got to put my faith in the powers to be. And they've got it so right at the moment, what else could I do? So you trust that level two is where you need to be, even though you're, you know, you're quite away from us here in Auckland. But I know a lot of locals that went to that music festival in Auckland on the weekend, and I know a lot of people that have been transferring down. So who knows where it is? I just put my faith in the experts, and level two is is where it's at. We've only got to do a week of it, and I think 
as a New Zealander, if it's going to save people's lives, if it's going to be the right thing to do, let's just roll up our sleeves and do it. What if you have to go longer than a week? Because it's not for sure when we're going to come out of this. I feel sorry for anyone that's under financial duress through this, but we've seen the alternatives overseas. We can either prepare for some financial damage or start preparing body bags. I trust the experts. As I said, I'm a sharer and a mayor. What would I know about it? So what's the what kind of financial hit do you take in your neck of the woods? At level um, two? In all, fair, in all fairness, uh, very limited. Uh, life is pretty well normal down here. We're just following those protocols of wearing a mask where we have to. I went into the hospital yesterday and I wore a mask. Keep your distancing. So it's not too much of an inconvenience to us. And we've done so much, you know, we've done so well. But we're on the brink of getting through this so unscathed compared with the rest of the world. And if it's a matter of following a few rules, and I know that people in Auckland will go, yeah, that's fine for you, mate. But what are the alternatives? And it is six minutes to six. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. After six tonight, are young people hearing and heeding the COVID message? The government is being warned it will have blood on its hands unless it reconsiders what the inquiry into drug buying agency Pharmac examines. The terms of reference of the long-awaited independent review were released today. While some are hopeful the inquiry will address racial inequalities, others have lost faith in the process before it's even begun. Here's political reporter Katie Scotcher. Malcolm Mulholland has been pushing for a pharmac inquiry since his wife was diagnosed with cancer in 2018. Today, the government committed to one and revealed what exactly it will examine. And he's not happy. What's it going to take for the politicians to wake up and actually take this issue seriously because lives are at stake? A panel of appointed experts will review the agency's performance and consider whether it needs new objectives. They will also examine the country's access to certain medicines, as well as the timelines and transparency of decision-making. But it won't scrutinise how much money is pumped into the agency each year. Health Minister Andrew Little explains why. The size of Pharmax budget is a political decision. That's what we as ministers and the Cabinet decides on. Really, this is about looking at the way Pharmac makes decisions within the budget that it's got. But Malcolm Mulholland argues the drug buying agency's budget is the root cause of many of its problems, so needs to be scrutinised. If they're not prepared to take the budget issue seriously, then this review will be a waste of time and they will have blood on their hands. Notably, the review won't look at any decisions Pharmac has made in the past or is currently considering, and if they were appropriate. It will also steer clear of any commercial matters, a decision Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern defends. Pharmac is our negotiator on behalf of all New Zealanders for the best possible price for pharmaceutical products, and there are certain things that we would want to make sure that we don't reveal in going through this process around the way that they operate in those commercial negotiations so that we don't lose that advantage that we have as a bulk buyer. National's health spokesperson Shane Retty wants the government to take the terms of reference back to the drawing board. He says someone from the pharmaceutical sector needs to be appointed to the review panel and Pharmax funding reviewed. I'd like them to review the terms of reference. Uh, I don't think they're expensive enough. I don't think New Zealanders will think they're expensive enough. We get one shot at this and we're going to wait two years before we get the written answers. So I think we need to get this right from the beginning. However, Matthew Tukaki from the Māori Council is pleased with the review and its terms of reference. He hopes it will address the inequities many Māori and Pacifica face when trying to access drug treatments. And why it is that Māori and Pacifica people in particular um, are often left at the bottom of the rug. We're not, we're not even considered in the process. Of- the reviewers, who include the consumer advocate Sue Chetwin and Helen Clark's former chief of staff Heather Simpson, will deliver an interim report in August. They then have until December to present their final findings. Atuiti Fari Padimata, Motihotaka Utiahiahine, Ko Katie Scott Churaho. 
There's fresh evidence the UK vaccination programme is having a dramatic effect on the numbers being admitted to hospital or dying from COVID-19. After a single dose of the Pfizer or AstraZeneca jab, hospitalisations have dropped by 80% among those over 80. The BBC's Fergus Walsh has more. A few seconds and it's done. More than 20 million of us have rolled up our sleeves and confidence in COVID vaccines is soaring here, with good reason. Data released in the past hour shows that a single dose of the Pfizer or Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is more than 80% effective at preventing hospitalisation among the over 80s, three to four weeks after the jab. There's a lot to look forward to. It's very tempting to just go, right, we've seen the results, that means the problem's fixed. Um, the problem isn't fixed yet, but we definitely have identified um, a way of fixing the problem, and the early data show us how to do that. Hospital admissions are falling fastest among the over 65s, among the first to get immunised, down by 48% since the start of the year. Compare that to a 35% drop among the under 65s, most of whom have yet to have a jab. And deaths among the over 65s are down by 57% in the same period, compared to a 47% decline in younger ages. Clear evidence that vaccines offer strong protection. And that was Fergus Walsh reporting. Um, mixed feedback on the alert levels and where different parts of the country are at. Let's start with Ian, who says there was no need for a nationwide level two COVID-19 lockdown. The lower North Island, East Coast Bay of Plenty, Hawke's Bay, Wairarapa and the whole of the South Island should have stayed at level one. What a waste, says Ian. On the other hand, this person in Auckland says we are doing uh, as we are supposed to. We don't want this to last any longer than it has to. RNZ News at 6, Nga mihi nui ko Susana Lei Atawa DNA. The police commissioner is going to give bullies within the workforce a second chance after a damning report revealed a toxic culture. The Independent Police Conduct Authority report painted a bleak picture of the police force and its leaders. Present and former staff say it's a boys' club rife with bullying. Andrew Costa says he will work with current management to ensure they are part of the change the organisation needs. It is completely unacceptable for any of our people to be treated in a way that leaves them feeling disenfranchised, undervalued, marginalised. It's not part of who we are and we won't tolerate it. I want this to be a workplace where all of our people can thrive and so we're going to work with all of our leaders to enable that to occur and of course if people aren't prepared to come on that journey we'll be having a conversation about it. Andrew Costa says there is no place for bad behaviour from leadership within the police force. The Mayor of Whangarei is urging the government to speed up its COVID vaccine awareness campaign to combat the spread of misinformation. The Ministry of Health says it got, it's got plans for a paid advertising campaign and it will launch in the coming months. But Cheryl Mai says there's already plenty of opposition to the vaccine in the north and people urgently need official information to reassure them. What we're seeing on the ground here uh, are the protesters and um, they're making themselves very visible. They're putting their placards up, they're um, putting flyers into leader boxes, leaving them in public toilets. Um, so, you know, that, unfortunately, from my perspective, that's what we're seeing. Cheryl Mai says countries such as Australia are already rolling out their vaccine awareness campaigns and New Zealand needs to catch up. Most contacts identified at Papatoi Toy High School at the centre of the latest Auckland COVID outbreak have been tested, but four refused. One of the first people in the cluster to test positive, Case A, was a student at the school. It was closed while everyone was tested and only one close contact returned a positive test. The Director General of Health, Dr Ashley Bloomfield, says four of the students' casual plus contacts refused a test, but he says they have had a management plan in place and he notes that any exposure to the coronavirus would have been back on February the 10th, three weeks ago. 
A man who put a spy camera in an Auckland gym's changing room is trying to have his case heard in the Supreme Court in a last-ditch effort to keep his identity secret. The man was a highly paid government agency manager when he videoed a naked couple and four others. The High Court and Court of Appeal both ruled he should be convicted of making an making an intimate visual recording and should lose name suppression. He was set to be publicly identified tomorrow, but this afternoon his lawyer filed a notice of appeal in the Supreme Court. The man's interim name suppression has now been extended and will remain in place until the Supreme Court process is complete. The Tourism Minister says he won't make any promises to struggling communities in Franz Joseph and Fox Glacier. Stuart Nash was on the West Coast today to speak with businesses and residents about their concerns. It follows a plea for more support and a nearly $35 million wish list to keep the communities afloat. But Mr Nash has ruled out funding the entire request, especially the wage subsidy extension. He says the government is working on a support package. Business all, businesses all around the country say they are doing it tough as the impacts of Alert Level 2 hit their sales. They say some customers are choosing to stay away because they're afraid of the virus threat. Sally Hollier, the co-owner of Napier gift shop Adore Collection, says there's been a clear drop since Level 2 returned. We have a slightly older clientele, so they really at level two are scared and stay at home. And you can see on the daily sales figures, it's 50% down day on day um, from the previous week. Shop owner Sally Hollier. The government is being warned people will die unless it reconsiders what the inquiry into drug buying agency Pharmac examines. A panel of experts has been appointed to review the agency, assess its performance and consider whether it needs new objectives. The review, however, will not look at any decisions Pharmac has made in the past or is currently considering and if they were appropriate. It also won't scrutinise how many government funding, how much government funding is pumped into the agency each year. Patient Voice Aotearoa spokesperson Malcolm Mulholland says the agency's budget is the root cause of many of its problems, so needs to be examined. If they're not prepared to take the budget issue seriously, then this review will be a waste of time and they will have blood on their hands. Patient Voice Aotearoa spokesperson Malcolm Mulholland. It's five minutes past six. The Silver Fern suitor Maya Wilson is looking forward to having a crack at Australia. Wilson has only had a few minutes of court time against the Diamonds, but after a breakout 2020 is now the frontline goal shoot for the Ferns. She says while she got some good international experience last year, she's keen to test herself against the world's best. At Nations Cup, I was able to test myself against the likes of Jamaica and England and I guess coming up against world-class netballers, but the one that I haven't really had solid minutes against is the Aussie Diamond. So to get that opportunity, looking forward to getting some, some game time and testing myself. Tonight's first Constellation Cup test is set to start at quarter past seven. New Zealand cricket have confirmed fans will be allowed at Sunday's international T20 double header if Wellington's alert level status is relaxed before then. The order of the matches has also been changed, with the Black Caps and Australia to play first, followed by the White Ferns and England. The change will allow the Australian squad to catch a charter flight home immediately after the game and avoid having to transit through Auckland. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is supporting a potential bid for the UK to host the Football World Cup for just the second time. More than $5 million will will reportedly be set aside by the British government in this week's budget to promote a bid for the 2030 tournament. England's 1966 triumph on home soil is the only time the World Cup has been held on British shores. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Tony Stamp samples True Colours, New Colours, in which a new generation of Kiwi musos reimagine the Split Ends classic. William Ray and Mihi Narangi Forbes present the final episode of Stories of Tainui, looking at the end and the legacy of the Waikato War. And our after-dinner geographer Louise Richards is back, and she's brought Warwick Murray with her. Together they're discussing globalisation on Nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National.
the short forecast from meet service to midnight tomorrow. Northland to Waitomo, Coromandel Peninsula, Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taumaranui. Scattered showers, some heavy this evening and again from tomorrow morning with thunderstorms possible and hail. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay mainly fine, a shower or two tomorrow afternoon and evening. Taranaki and Thai happy to Wellington, also wider upper. Fine spells and isolated showers, showers becoming widespread, possibly heavy inland during the afternoon and evenings. For Marlborough, Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, outbreaks of rain or showers with thunderstorms possible along the west coast tomorrow. Canterbury mainly fine, a shower or two possible tonight. Otago and Southland, a few showers, possibly heavy and thundery this evening for Dunedin and Clutha. And Chatham Islands, mostly cloudy with drizzle possible tomorrow. RNZ National, it's eight minutes past six. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. The Silver Ferns are hitting the court against their arch rivals, the Australian Diamonds, shortly. But because of COVID restrictions, there'll be no crowds. Now that means there'll also be no money from the ticket take. Netball New Zealand Chief Executive Jenny Wiley joins me now. Kia ora Jenny, where are you for a start? Well, I am safely ensconced in, at home in Auckland um, and looking forward to, to seeing those guys out on court via the TV tonight. Yeah, and I bet you still are enthusiastic about watching them, but it's a bit of a bummer, isn't it, to be stuck up there and up here and, and no audience? Yeah, look, completely gutting not to be there with the team and Knowles um, to support them. But we know they're in pretty good hands. Um, but you're right, you know, not to have a crowd in this evening at an important, really first test match that we've had against Aussie since 2019 um, will be a surreal experience, no doubt, for the players and management. Yeah, so what difference do you think it will make to the game? Because obviously you feed off that energy and enthusiasm, don't you, of the crowd? Yeah, look, it is, it's like that eighth player. It's um, in a Kiwi crowd. It, nothing beats a Kiwi crowd. Um, so that is an important factor for the players. But I think um, in many ways, you know, our ANZ players have gotten used to not having crowds. Many from the Pulse and Tactics and, and Steel and Magic have all played in that environment before with no crowds. So they're, um, they're able to get themselves up, but it will change the dynamic for them, no doubt. And what about the financial side of things? I mean, how much revenue have you lost because of the restrictions here? Well, it, it's a mix of both revenue. Obviously, there'll be no gate for any of the games unless levels change come um, the weekend. But also, we've had to put down venue deposits and accommodation deposits. And so it's quite significant when you put all of those things together. And, you know, it's just shy of um, half a million bucks. So that's material for us as a as a leading female sport in this country. Um, we did we were aware that this could have been a possibility when we went into this series, but uh, you know it's certainly going to hurt the bottom line. So, can you give us an idea how much is it just for the stadium? Oh, look, there's a mix of costs for the stadium. I mean, we had a cost for Tauranga, and relocating back to Christchurch makes a difference. But then there are elements like Christchurch no longer being able to hold the event that they were going to have this weekend. So it's quite a mix of different cost structures. There's MIQ costs that come into it, and then there's obviously gates. So a whole series of things that go into it lots of moving parts. I want to talk about MIQ, but before then, can you give us a bit of a ballpark? Are you talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Where are we in the scale here? So, so across both cost and revenue, we're looking just shy of half a million dollars um, impact to us, um, which is, you know, it's pretty significant. Um, and we've just been fortunate that we've looked after ourselves through 2020 and um, put something away to be able to help us cushion a little bit. When you say cushion a little bit, though, where does that leave you? Well, it would be half a million bucks lost to the bottom line. Is That's actually where it leaves us for this test series. Are you in the um, red, though, Jenny? For this test series, we are, yeah. And what about overall? No, overall, last year we put some um, aside, some reserves aside to be able to um, cushion us for events like this. Um, but Netball New Zealand only sits on about three or four months operating revenue in reserve. So it is material when you take a half a million dollar hit um, and we will need to dip in re into reserves to be able to fund us.
So tell us about the MIQ costs, right? So you have um, you've stumped up for the Australians, and you also helped the England Roses out. So how much did all of that cost you? Well, uh, over both series, it's not a material. Um, the government and has been really clear. You know, back when we played the Roses, it was seven thousand bucks a head into MIQ, and that was only part of the cost. Um, and the government wore some parts of that. And that has been a changing uh, number as we go into Australia, but not too dissimilar. So we are sharing the cost with Australia this time round, 50-50. Um, and we have condensed the series in order to be able to minimise their time away from Australia as well. But, you know, these added level restrictions really do um, play in, you know, a part in increasing those costs. Yeah, so does someone need to step in and help you out here? Does the government need to chip in something? Because these are extraordinary times. And as you've pointed out, um, where this is women's sport, which sometimes takes a back seat as well. It's really complicated, but um, in many ways we've had quite a bit of government support. Um, there has been, you know, we, they've made it really clear we've got a plan for every contingency. And as it, we're, we're really clear, we've been planning for this ourselves. Um, last year we actually cut into the muscle of our business. We didn't run so many of our domestic events. Um, that was both because of COVID, but because we needed to put stuff aside. Um, so we have been really fortunate to get government support. We went into this with our eyes open, but unfortunately, one of the worst case scenarios has, has slightly played out. So um, we're, we've got an amazing netball public. What we're hearing is so many people want to donate their ticket um, price to us so that we can enable those domestic events to take place this year. And I'm determined that they will go ahead. So we've also got to help ourselves. Um, and we're just fortunate that the netball public are also willing to support us in that way. So we we should find out sort of by Friday afternoon potentially about the alert levels. Uh, are you saying even if you drop down to level one, you, you won't revisit having a crowd at the weekend games? Oh, we absolutely will revisit that. I think it's, uh, you know, we want those fans in in the first place, in the first instance. Um, and so we've got contingency plans. We're working with our ticketing agency now. And we will obviously take the lead from government, but I think we would love to be able to get those people into the stadium if the alert levels change. Right, so you will fire up for that um, that Sunday game if you drop down? Absolutely. I mean, it'd be great to have a whole bunch of cantabs in there cheering on the Silver Ferns for that final match. Thank you for your time this evening and best of luck. That is Netball New Zealand Chief Executive Jenny Wiley speaking to us there. The 1pm update, adverts, Facebook updates, emergency push notifications. The government's tried numerous ways to get us to unite against COVID-19. But after a number of people broke isolation rules before testing positive for COVID-19, some say those messages aren't reaching the right communities. Our Youth Affairs reporter Katie Doyle has more. In 2020, Dr Ashley Bloomfield became a fixture on our TV screens. And in 2021, he burst onto the festival scene. Kia ora koutou. Hello New Zealand. This remix playing at gigs throughout the country. I'm Dr Ashley Bloomfield. A reminder to young New Zealanders about the risk of COVID-19. Wash and sanitise hands often. But the government's now under fire for its messaging, with some feeling there isn't enough specifically targeting young New Zealanders. Te Pāti Māori co-leader Debbie Ngāri Wapaka says Rangatahi have told her the messages are too long and aren't landing on the right channels. Most importantly, I think, and this is across a whole lot of Rangatahi grassroots, those in university, um, all sorts, young, young Rangatahi are saying that they can't relate because they're actually not seeing anyone that is there their age group that they can affiliate with. TK from Ngaru Wahia High School in Waikato reckons the government is doing a good job getting information out there. He's seen a few ads on YouTube, but he says the communication isn't always clear. Maybe just to be a bit more explicit or like just do something so that like in high schools they could talk about us more maybe or just to like really give a rundown on like the different requirements for the levels and stuff. Even if it's like once every time we go into lockdown or like once like 
you or something, just to like make sure all students know. At the centre of the outbreak, Papa Toy Toy High in Auckland. Its head girl, Rhonda Nguyen, says the school's been working hard to provide everyone with the most up-to-date information. From my perspective, I guess from my school, every single time there was a new update, we would get like an email, a text, um, and a Facebook update. So we were well informed. She's also seen government messages on social media platforms. They are on Instagram, I believe. I've seen posts around work, like updates as well. I just... I guess for us, we rely on our smaller community. So, like, for me, it would be, like, my school, and that's where I've been getting a lot of my information from. Dr Ashley Bloomfield says communication to Papa Tui Tui High School in particular has been clear. I don't think there were any inconsistencies. I think we were very clear about what the message was to the school, and I think we can point to the fact that, you know, over 98% of students had had a test before they and then before they returned to school last Monday. So I think it was very clear what the message was to the school community and what the expectation was, in fact the requirement was on students. He says there's a dedicated social media team at the Ministry of Health, which until recently didn't even have a Facebook page. But Dr Bloomfield has no plans to get on TikTok yet. And as for his burgeoning music career... I was very happy to uh, be able to support getting that message out in formats that I think I understand, talking to my um, children, uh, resonated with uh, people younger than myself. It's time to make summer unstoppable. The Checkpoint, Katie Doyle. It is 18 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Now, some of your feedback on the issue of messages around what we should do at different alert levels. This person says, are the public health authorities on the ground in Papatoitoi, visiting families in their homes, being visible on the streets, creating a booth in malls and shopping centres to provide information? Jackie's got in touch to say 15 attempts to contact a family of concern via text, email, etc., but not one actual visit to the home. Anyone would realise that another message Method of contacting the family other than electronic messaging was required. And this person says COVID messaging is as clear now as it was a year ago. No excuses. Some people just don't give a toss. The Duke of Edinburgh has been transferred to another hospital for tests for his heart condition. The 99-year-old has already spent nearly two weeks at a hospital in London. The BBC's Nicholas Witchell reports. King Edward VII Hospital this morning. An ambulance had been reversed up to a rear entrance. Umbrellas were raised by staff to shield the view of a patient who is being placed into the ambulance. It's believed the patient was the Duke of Edinburgh. As the ambulance departed, it was assumed he was leaving after 30 nights in the hospital to be taken home to Windsor Castle. But at 12.30, this statement was issued by Buckingham Palace. The Duke of Edinburgh was today transferred from King Edward VII's hospital to St Bartholomew's Hospital, where doctors will continue to treat him for an infection, as well as undertake testing and observation for a pre-existing heart condition. The journey across London was a short one. St Bartholomew's, or Bart's, is Britain's oldest hospital, but it has some of the most modern and extensive facilities for cardiac care. It's a recognised centre of excellence. It's the the largest specialist centre for this type of condition in the UK and one of the largest in Europe. And so you can see all of the subspecialists, whether it's a problem with the heart rhythm, a problem with the blood supply to the heart or the heart muscle, all uh, under one roof and delivering care at the same time. The Duke has suffered heart issues in the past. In 2011, there was an emergency admission to Papworth Hospital in Cambridgeshire. He'd suffered chest pains at Sandringham. The Queen and his immediate family all went to his bedside. A blocked coronary artery was diagnosed. It had been a close call. Yet there's been no suggestion until today of any recurrence of any heart problems. For a man approaching his 100th birthday, the Duke has seemed in generally good health. Yet his hospital stay is now longer than any previous one. It's unclear whether the Duke will require any surgical procedure on his heart, such as occurred in 2011. On that occasion, he had a stent inserted to relieve the blocked coronary artery. On this occasion, all the palace will say is that he's comfortable and responding to treatment. The BBC's Nicholas Witchell there.
The Duke of Sussex says he felt history was repeating itself in the months before he and his wife decided to step back from the royal family. In clips from an interview with Oprah Winfrey to be broadcast on US television, Prince Harry says he can't imagine what his mother went through when she gave up her royal role in the 90s. The BBC's Daniela Ralph has more. Were you silent or were you silenced? No answer to that yet from Meghan. But this was just the trailer ahead of next weekend's broadcast of the much anticipated interview. Almost unsurvivable. Sounds like there was a breaking point. My biggest concern was history repeating itself. From Prince Harry, the talk is of his mother and protecting his wife. I can't begin to imagine what it must have been like for her going through this process by herself all those years ago because it has been unbelievably tough for the two of us but at least we had each other yeah. oprah winfrey has become a friend and neighbor of the couple since being invited to their wedding her interview style isn't aggressive but she will have encouraged them to open up and reveal what went wrong behind palace walls and that is the concern of the royal family how critical have harry and meghan been Daniela Ralph reporting. The rise in bitcoins brought great wealth to some, at least in their cyber wallets, but it turns out the cryptocurrency has a huge carbon footprint, worrying those who want to cut global carbon emissions. The BBC's Justin Rowlett reports. Bitcoin hitting another milestone again today. It broke through the $50,000 level just a short time ago. And I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, to be honest. Where is it going? It's probably going to 100, then 150, then 200,000. Bitcoin has been in the headlines a lot in the last month. Earlier this week, the cryptocurrency peaked at $58,000. But it's not just its price that has hit an all-time high. So has its energy footprint. So we have a pretty comprehensive global estimate of how much energy is being used. And even that estimate ranges from 39 terawatts to 419 terawatts. And our best guess within that range is about 123 terawatts today. Which is about as much electricity as the whole of Argentina consumes in a year. Gina Peters is a professor of economics at the University of Chicago. She's also a research fellow at Cambridge University's Centre of Alternative Finance, which studies the burgeoning business of cryptocurrencies. She says Bitcoin is energy intensive by design because it relies on a decentralized network of miners who all independently verify and record every transaction made in the currency. So how do you get people to maintain this record accurately? You're essentially going to enlist people by paying them in Bitcoins if they are the first to compile and submit this record in a way that is acceptable to the system. So every 10 minutes you have to put together this compilation of transactions and submit it, but there's a special trick to this. They have to guess a random number, and then if you're the first to do so, you get at the moment six and a quarter bitcoins, valued at $50,000 each. As the price of Bitcoin rises, more miners want to get in on the game. But when that happens, the system is designed to make the number harder to guess. So computing effort increases. Bitcoin miners are currently reckoned to be making 150 quintillion calculations a second. That is a billion billion. So if you're wondering what that sound is... Well, you'd need to ramp that up to more than 340 beats per second. And then play it every second since the universe formed 13.8 billion years ago to reach 150 quintillion. And that is how many calculations all those miners are doing in one second. Unsurprisingly, that uses a lot of electricity. You see it all around the world. Bitcoin is being mined from geothermal energy in Iceland. In the end of this year, data centers in Iceland will use more electricity than all of the homes in Iceland combined. <laughs> to hydropower in the Caucasus Mountains of Georgia. It's consuming more electricity than, for example, big industries that Georgia has. It's beating everyone, actually. And two-thirds of the energy used is reckoned to be created from polluting fossil fuels.
And that report was from the BBC. A Californian teen who shares a name with a huge US bank has got an 18th birthday surprise from his namesake. CNN's Marie Edgner has the story. Chase Banks hears a lot of jokes about his name. Like everyone, my name's Chase Banks. Everyone, like, well, they'll send me pictures on Snapchat of like the bank and stuff. They're like, hey, look, it's your house and stuff like that. But he's never seemed to mind. In fact, he's making the most of it, collecting memorabilia with his name on it, the bank's name on it. About three months ago, I had wrote to them because I was looking for a Chase Banks decal for um, his truck that we were getting him. And I couldn't find one. So I had just messaged the bank and asked if they could get me one that I could buy. Wow. The bank went a step further. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Surprising Chase with all sorts of Chase Bank goodies for his 18th birthday. I, I thought it was crazy. Like there's like a dog at my door. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. It was new to me today. <laughs> just getting to be a part of the celebration for him, you know, um, when you work for the industry that I'm in, you're constantly connecting with people and their personal lives. And, and so getting to be a part of his personal celebration just was an honor for me. This is Chase's senior year, spending it away from school, away from friends, not getting to play baseball like he's used to. It's been rough. The visit made the year more memorable, this time for a good reason. It definitely like brightened up, like it made my whole year basically like it was very unexpected and like different for like this time. It was, it was very nice. And that report from CNN. We've had a lot of feedback about the Erebus Memorial planned for um, the park in Parnell. This person says, my dad died in the Erebus crash. The structure and the location of the memorial are not relevant to the accident. Our treatment by the government after the disaster was appalling. 40 years later, I am still angry with the government and I don't want either the structure or the location as a memory of my father. Our family was never contacted and my attempts to engage with the Ministry of Culture etc. were dismissed and met with arrogance. Sarah says, given the vast majority of those who died on Mount Erebus were from Auckland, I'm sure their families would prefer the memorial there. I think the design is elegant and fitting and suited to the proposed place. Murray says, the great majority of those who died at Erebus lived in Auckland. The pa was on the point uh, used for reclamation to create the main rail trunk. Ngāti Whātua have already given its blessing um, to this. It's beside the original centre for air travel from New Zealand. Just build the thing, says Murray. Someone else though says I agree with Nader, Dame Nader the beautiful tree should stay, the park given its original Māori name and the monument put somewhere else we're back tomorrow RNZ News headlines at 6.30 in response to a report by the Independent Police Conduct Authority describing a toxic culture in the police the Commissioner says he will be reviewing the work of current managers Community leaders are urging the government to speed up the release of its COVID vaccine awareness campaign to combat misinformation by anti-vaccination groups. The cost of the 14-day managed isolation for a person on a temporary entry visa is going up by almost $1,500 to $5,500. Police in Australia have closed their investigation into an historical rape allegation against a federal cabinet minister by a woman who killed herself last year, saying they don't have enough admissible evidence. Our next news and weather is at 7. Take the pulse of the day's news every weeknight at 10. But we are of the very strong view that actually the end of life phase is just as much a part of the health sector. Live with local, national and international stories as they happen. The whole idea is that none of us are safe until all of us are safe and so let's vaccinate the world as fast as we possibly can. Up to date if you're up late. Lately with Karen Hay every weeknight from 10 on RNZ National. Thanks, Karen. I'm Brian Crump, getting ready for another night on RNZ National. My guests tonight, after the news at 7, Louise Richards and Warwick Murray, my two after-dinner geographers. And they want to talk about globalisation, which is a pretty big topic, certainly as big as the planet. And then Jamie Tahana. We'll probably have Jamie on before the news at 10. He normally works for RNZ Pacific and we often hear him on the night shift doing Dateline Pacific, but he's doing an internal OE 
He can't travel overseas, so he's travelling within Aotearoa. He's walking the Te Araroa Trail, and we're jumping in or checking in on Jamie every now and then. He's currently between legs in Tauranga, and we'll hear from him before the news at 10. In this half hour on RNZ National, later on we'll have a little piece that's been trending well on our website, getting a lot of clicks. First off, the detail looks at our plummeting birth rate and the implications of such. Kia ora, I'm Emil Donovan, and today on The Detail... Well, the country's fertility rate has fallen again to a record low for the 10th year in a row. New Zealand is 